right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this month's American Rum Roundtable. I'm just kind of sneaking it in here on the last day of April. I've been trying to do these uh, once every month since February. And so going three for three so far, feeling pretty good about it. Um, so it's good to have you here today. I'm here with three guests, actually, uh, to talk about a topic that I think is really fascinating, uh, which is growing sugarcane for the purpose of making rum. Uh, I'll, I'll go west to east in my introduction, kind of. So we have Steve Jefferson from Kuleana Rum Works in Hawaii. Uh, we have Eric Vonk from Richland Rum in Georgia. And Pepe Alvarez from San Juan Artisan Distillers in Puerto Rico. So uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, really excited to talk about this with you today. Great to be with you, Will. Yeah, thanks so, for having us. This is super exciting for us. Thanks. Yeah, well, really, absolutely. Thanks for the invitation and putting this together. I think it's, uh, it's really exciting to be here. Definitely. So before we get started, um, I'm Will Hoginga from American Rum Report and Zavi.co. Um, and like I said, the, this is the third kind of round table we've done together. Uh, the goal of this is, is really just to gather a handful of rum producers from across the country and talk about a specific topic. And uh, this is one I've had in mind from the beginning because, you know, I, I've always admired uh people who start distilleries, distillers, just because it's it's from everything I've seen from the conversations I've had, it's not easy at all. It takes a ton of work from the business side, uh, also the creative side of like actually making the rum, you know, that's that's a, a challenge as well. And um, sorry, I, guys, I was getting a little bit of an echo, so I may just kind of mute and unmute mics. So if you see that, just, uh, just disregard it. I'll, I'll unmute you in a second. But um, uh, basically, the interesting thing about all three of you guys is, you know, the challenge of starting a distillery and, and making rum wasn't enough. You also wanted to grow sugarcane, uh, manage a farm and do all that. Um, and you're doing it in places where these days it's pretty uncommon. You know, um, Puerto Rico obviously has a long history of rum production, um, but the sugarcane industry has largely gone away. Um, uh, Hawaii has a really long history of sugarcane production, but the industry is kind of phased out um, over the past few decades. And um, Georgia, you know, is, is a history of sugarcane production, but not the first place that comes to mind when people think about rum. So um, anyway, uh, before we jump into everything, I, I want to say hello to everyone uh, I see in the chat. We have uh, Justin Owens from Thrasher's Rum in Washington, D.C., uh, Dave Russell from San Francisco, John Atkins in Virginia, Brad Kraus making rum all the way down in Panama. Uh, Jer Anderson. So good to see you all. Feel free to say hello. Uh, let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, it's always cool to see that. And uh, also, if you have any questions for uh, for Pepe, for Eric, for Steve at any point during the live stream, there's a little button at the bottom that says ask a question. So just pop your questions in there. You'll see me looking over here. I'm keeping an eye on those. Um, always love to get questions. So, so please don't be shy about submitting those. And uh, last but not least, invite your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top that makes it easy to do that. Uh, Tyler from Kohana Rum. Uh, awesome. Hey, Tyler. So that's the, the hard thing about putting these together is like I always you know, want to put like nine or ten people on them <laughs> because there's so many interesting people making rum. Um, Tyler is uh, Kohana is a great distillery uh, growing sugar cane as well in Hawaii. So um, good to see you, uh, Ernest. Hey, what's up? Uh, awesome. So guys, to get started, um, the first thing, you know, I, I, I alluded a little bit to just how unique, you know, your situations are. Um, not a lot of people doing what you're doing. Uh, I'd love for each of you to kind of give some brief background on, on what pushed you uh, to do this in the first place, to start your distillery and to grow sugarcane and, and use that for making rum. So um, Steve, maybe I'll pick on you uh, up first uh, if you want to jump in and, and give us the backstory. Yeah, great. Um, again, thanks a lot. This is super exciting for us. Um, for us, it started on a complete accident, if you will. I mean, it was we had no idea. Um, so we were sailing around in the Caribbean. Um, we'd left Hawaii when when the when the in two thousand six. Um, when we figured the housing market was going to crash, and we didn't want to get caught in a crash in Hawaii because it's not that fun. So we were fortunate enough to have just enough money to buy a sailboat and squeak out of there. Um, and so it was a big risk. We had a one and three year old and we were just sailing around in the Caribbean. 
And one day we went up to Martinique and, and we heard there was a sugarcane farm up there and we thought, oh, that's just like home. And so we went up there and we heard they're serving rum. So we're like, okay, cool. And we made our way up there and it was beautiful. Um, and we, you know, when you're living on a boat, you want to live on a house. When you're living in a house, you want to live on a boat. So <laughs> we're looking at this going, oh my gosh, you know, this is where we probably we want to settle in a place just like this. Right. The farm was beautiful. And then it was DePaz Distillery, if anyone's ever been there. And, and we were just sort of struck with how beautiful it was. Um, and it's very similar to Hawaii. Um, and then we tried the rum and, and I was blown away. I'd never had rum with that much sort of character and flavor before. And that was rum agricole, which is everybody knows it's rum made from fresh sugarcane juice. And I was just, wow, what is this? And, uh, and within five minutes, my wife and I looked at each other and said, we got to move back to Hawaii and start this because this is unbelievable. Um, and that's basically how we got started. Excellent. Um, Pepe, why don't, why don't you jump in and, and tell us how, how, how San Juan Artisan Distillers uh, and then the, that big field of sugar cane you have behind it came to be? Sure. Thank you, Will. Thanks again for uh, getting this together. It's, a, it's really exciting and fun to be sharing this platform with, with, with these three panelists, two panelists and, and the rest of the group out there. Well, our, our story is very similar to Steve's. Uh, I, I was, I've been a landscaper all my life. I got out of high school in 76, and there was a, a horrible economic depression in the island. I couldn't find a job anywhere. I needed a, a day job, and I needed to, you know, I would study at night. And I had, I had worked two summer jobs previously as a landscaper, a gardener, uh, with, his, with his friends. And... It was a perfect fit for me. I grew up in front of the ocean in Santurce in Puerto Rico on the beach. And uh, basically I, all I did all, since I was eight was surf and do water sports and be in the water all day long. So I got into landscaping because I could go surf whenever the waves were good and shut the shop, shop down and I, I could go surfing. So I, I grew up in that and uh, started the land, landscaping business and one thing led to another. A lot of people started calling and they needed landscaping services and the, the business grew incredibly. I bought one farm, then another farm, then another farm. All of a sudden, I didn't have any time to surf anymore. <laughs> so about 10 years, I did, we did that for about, I did that for about 35 years. And I, I, it was a blessing. I never imagined that, you know, a surfer from Ocean Park, you know, would, you know, that would get so far. So... Uh, all of a sudden, the economy in Puerto Rico was, uh, in 2008 with the uh, bank recession all over the world. Puerto Rico has been depressed economically for a while, and there was, there was no work. So I, I needed to reinvent myself and, and do something different, and I was looking for something fun to do uh, and something that would you know, uh, stir passion in me and do something special. And I looked at different alternatives, and I finally, I traveled to Martinique, as Steve, Steve did, and I did uh, the... There's a trend route, happening here. The uh, route, route to Rome that they have, which is amazing. And my wife and I visited about five or six distilleries in five or six days. We stayed there, and we stayed at this little beautiful boutique hotel that was owned by one of the distillery owners that I had contacted, the people from Nissan who are to make incredible oh, rum. Yeah, very and good. He referred me to other, uh, you know, we basically were just, you know, uh, window shopping and, and steering an idea. And we fell in love with the concept and saw the potential that this had in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico being so, so well known and so famous worldwide for its rum and in the Caribbean, that it felt like a, like a perfect fit to create a special distillery that produced a something similar to what we had experienced, the same as Steve did in, in Martinique. And it would be something unique. We wouldn't be coming into this big market um, that has traditional molasses produced runs. It would it would be a, a very difficult, uh, very difficult to compete in that world. So I having the experience that I had with the landscaping business that I grew saw I threw plants, sugar, uh, uh, palm trees, and we, we produce everything. And sugarcane is agraminia, it's from the family of the grass uh, family. It's 
So I had been growing grass for 30 years and I thought it would be similar. How, long, how wrong was that? It's a totally different animal. Uh, it's affected by wind, by excess water, by this, by that. But sure, can you basically mow like a sod and it grows back up. It, 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 it's part family of the bamboo family as well, which are gramineas as well. So we decided, I decided to go forward with it and start to reinvent, reinvent myself and started substituting the planting of the sugarcane of, of our grass, our sod, and our plants, because there was no business going on with, with uh, sugarcane. And little by little started assembling the distillery and, and uh, different opportunities uh, search that uh, distillery that was available owned by a French company, spirits company in Trinidad became available and they, it was a complete French distillery that had uh, these amazing uh, Chalvinier pot stills, uh, three of them, and a bunch of tanks and fermenters and everything. So I basically flew down there, was able to buy everything, packed everything, loaded everything in the truck and sent everything to Puerto Rico and, and started assembling the distillery. And it's been basically a, a lot, a lot of work. I never imagined I'd be working as hard at this point in my life, 10 years later. But we're having more fun than ever, and it, it's really incredible. Awesome. Are you getting any surfing in these days? I have two longboards uh, <laughs> in my garage. And, and I, last time I went surfing, I almost got drowned. So my, it was my, you know, my family said, we think you should take it easy with the surfing. Stick, thing. stick to the rum. Stick to the yeah, rum. We don't right? want to lose it yet. So, and, so we've been doing lots of boating. We enjoy Puerto Rico located geographically an incredible place where you can sail from Puerto Rico all the way down to South America and it's a stepping stone one little island next to the other and and it's 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 just incredible so we we've, we've been doing lots of boating and scuba diving lately and discovered that recently and having a lot of fun and, and doing doing rum every day <laughs> squeezing it in yeah um eric so i think you've actually been doing this um the longest out of everyone uh what R richland wait, did you start in like the the late 90s am i remembering correctly 1999 so, yeah so I, it's also interesting just because i think when people think about sugarcane they think about um tropical locations i think hawaii and puerto rico you know people see it fitting in there um people don't don't realize as much i think places like Georgia, um, where sugarcane has grown for a long time. Um, so how, how did you put that together with rum? Um, how, did, how did it all get started? As you know, I, uh, I, I grew up in Holland and uh, had a grandfather, my mom's dad, uh, who had traveled around the world in search of good rums. He had this huge collection of rums from all around the world. And with one thing in common, they were all agricoles. They were all made from fresh cane. And uh, as an impressionable teenager, he explained that, that that way you get a very different product than when mm -hmm. you make rum from molasses. And um, that always left me with an idea that, hey, if there's ever an opportunity to grow some cane, I'm, I'm going to do it and make rum. And uh, so many decades passed, and uh, all of a sudden, I found myself living in Atlanta, Georgia. And even after a number of years living in Atlanta, I had no clue that Georgia, the southern part of the state, had ever produced rum. And one day, driving here in this area, south, southern Georgia, um, I saw there was a little stand along the road, and a guy selling sugarcane syrup. He had this mm -hmm. old, old grinder, and he was selling sugarcane syrup. I was driving by and I thought, hmm, sugarcane syrup. And all of a sudden, I said, sugarcane syrup. I <laughs> Wait you. a second, yeah. And, uh, and, and went to him and said, hey, sugarcane, uh, where, where, where do you get that? <laughs> and right behind this guy, there's this patch of sugarcane. And he looks like me, like, oh, there's this guy, you know, probably from the big city. And he goes, uh -huh. um, pointing at the sugarcane behind him. So that's how I found out that, that southern Georgia, uh, it's, it's as far north as you can grow cane, but it, it, it does, uh, some varieties do actually very well here. And what has been interesting is that I found out later that um, the varieties that do well here in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, um, some of them have been introduced by 
Dutch immigrants from Indonesia uh, in oh, fascinating. the 1800s. And there's a variety that I now grow called POJ. And a lot of people always ask, what POJ? What does that stand for? It's actually Dutch. Proofstation Oost Java, testing station Eastern Java. Wow. And that was a variety that was uh, developed there, taken by Dutch immigrants here to southern Georgia. And it, it's has spread all over the southern part of the southeastern states. But that's, that's, that, that's how it, I, I, I <laughs> how love it that. Developed. It's it's interesting because I I spent a lot of my childhood in North Alabama and it, there's a similar dynamic where you go to the southern part of the state and you'll see things like people selling sugarcane syrup and we're having little pack, uh, patches of sugarcane. But I was totally unaware of all of that um, being in the north part of the state. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of fascinating how there's um, little traces of that kind of throughout the southeast if you know where to look. Um, so I want to give everyone a little bit of a sense of what production, the sugarcane production looks like for each of you. Um, I, I've pulled up some pictures, um, and Eric, you're, you're, you're first, so I'm just going to grab these. But I'd love if you could um, just kind of give people a sense of where your farms are relative to your distillery, um, how much sugar cane you're growing, and what, what production kind of looks like throughout the calendar year for you. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, the distillery is in a small town called Richland, and the, that's what the town has been named after the brand, right? At the, no, oh, no, 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 that's the other way. <laughs> you get the other way around. Uh, but um, um, the farm is uh, about five miles uh, outside Richland. Um, we have... Um, uh, a larger farm there, but we grow about 300 acres in, uh, in cane, wow. um, primarily POJ and some uh, varieties that go back to uh, what is called Georgia red or, or purple ribbon, uh, the purple ribbon varieties. Um, the, um, the yields are not very good. As far as that's concerned, I'm going to be very uh, jealous of what Steve and, and Pepe are, are going to share with us. But um, because of the climate uh, environment, have, we're, we're way north of the, of the tropics, mm -hmm. uh, we can harvest once a year. Uh, usually we start around Thanksgiving, late November, okay. uh, and er into mid-December. Um, late December, early January, we can have frost. It doesn't have happen every year, but it can have we can have frost. And uh, as as we all know, frost kills sugarcane instantly, immediately. So um, we usually try to get everything in by early December, uh, and um, have therefore a very different rhythm than uh, sugarcane growers and rum makers have in a tropical environment where you can just harvest as you need and continue to have uh, work year round. Right. We have to do everything, condense everything in one harvest season, crush everything, uh, which is a, a, a monumental task in uh, just a handful of weeks. And then we condense it to syrup. We, we heat it up and let water evaporate until we are at about 80 bricks or so in, uh, in sugar content. And that's it, without any additives or anything else, it's just heated uh, and condensed to syrup. And it's the syrup that we store throughout the year and deplete until the next uh, harvest season. The right. yields are poor. Um, we produce uh, about a barrel and a half or so out of an acre. Wow. Uh, and uh, so... Um, you know, you, you, you're looking at um, 400 ish, 450 uh, barrels of uh, rum out of what we uh, grow. Wow. And, and when, when you talk about the yields, I know obviously you're working with on a condensed calendar. Um, so, so that kind of puts a limit on how much you can get out. Is, is the environment you're growing in does it also diminish like the the amount of juice you would expect from the cane as well yes um the the, the cane doesn't get as tall uh, okay we uh, 
maybe eight to 10 feet is, uh, is, is as, as much as we get. Uh, in tropical areas, there can be much more. Uh, also, the size of the stock remains, therefore, remains limited. By the way, we, we usually plant, plant in August, September, okay. uh, just enough time for the, uh, the planted stock to develop roots. And then by the, the cold season, it, it, it stops growing, of course, whatever has sprout, been sprouted out, like small sprouts, like you see in the picture, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes freezes, but uh, the roots will survive. And then as soon as the temperatures go up and the soil gets warmer in February, March, it, boom, it, it grows. So you have an about 14 months growing season like you, like you have in the, in, 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 in the tropics. Um, the, um, the sh the, so the, the number of gallons per acre, it would be far less than you would see in uh, okay. tropical areas. Uh, I would say we yield about 25 to 3,000 gallons per acre. Per acre, uh, and um, but the sugar content is high. It's, okay, it, it's a very sweet, uh, high uh, sugar environment. And and you you talked about. Um... Wait, Will, can I ask him how high? Just oh, curious. absolutely, yeah, jump in, please. <laughs> what is uh, the bricks? As a matter of fact, I I I, I need to. Uh, Provide you that answer later. I, I don't know by heart. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, say anything that later can be held against me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is uh, it is comparatively high. Uh, maybe uh, maybe I can look it up uh, while we're talking later on. Um, I've had a lot of support from the uh, USDA. Uh, they have a uh, station in uh, Louisiana oh, uh, right. where they have a couple of agronomists who are specialized in sugarcane and uh, the interaction with them over the years over the decades has been very intensive and uh, we've seen um, we've had a lot of lot of help from them and and it's it's there steve that uh, we've we've seen comparative tables uh, in varieties and in regions and uh, seen that uh, the, the uh, region where we're in, uh, running from Louisiana up to basically into South Carolina along the coast, um, has high, tends to have, most varieties have, tend to have relatively high sugar content. Excellent. Um, well, Steve, I'd, I'd love to go to you next. Um, give us kind of the lay of the land of what things look like uh, for you at, at Kuleana and in terms of your sugarcane production. Okay, great. Um, we're on the northern tip of the Big Island. Um, so in this photo here, this you is, can actually... This is such a... I just like every time I see this photo, it looks like made up um, or something that's not real with the ocean. <laughs> it feels right made up, there. to yeah. be honest. When you, every morning, you know, when you show up, it's like we don't... I don't go there every morning, but, it, you know, every morning that I do go there, it's kind of a magical feeling. Yeah. Um, so this is on the very northern tip of the Big Island. So this uh, just barely off to the right by that clump of sugar cane off to the right. If you go out to the ocean, that's Upolo Point. So that's the northern tip of the Big Island. Okay. Um, and that island you see in the background is Maui. Um, and that's the volcano, Paleakala. Um, and so we're, we're at the closest point to Maui. So it's just a gorgeous view. And because we're on the point, we actually have probably around 250 degree view of the ocean. Wow. Um, and so it's, it's really cool. Um, so to your right and your left are also ocean views. Um, and this is old sugarcane land. Um, this was planted, they started planting around mid 1800s. Um, and, and then it was a uh, sugarcane farm for Kohala Sugar Company until 1975 when it shut down. Okay. Um, and the very last sugar left, commercial sugar left Hawaii in 2016. It shut down on Maui across the way there. Um, and so basically between 75 and, and 2016, it, it didn't make sense to grow sugar on the big island anymore. And of course, you know, we hatched this idea in 2007, um, and started getting, uh, basically learning how to make rum, came back to Hawaii, um, bought a little teeny still, 
and and we're literally cutting sugarcane from the side of the road from from <laughs> leftover pieces of uh, you know because great swaths of the island were were harvested in sugarcane. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we would take it and, and we'd have names like Pepeekeo Feral or Hamakua Wild, you know, and we just literally like, you know, grabbing whatever sugar cane was growing on the side of the road and crushing it and making rum with it, trying to figure out what we're doing. And then we heard about this guy that was getting his PhD, who was also from Maui, and he's getting his PhD in the agriculture. It's called the Hawaiian field system. And what we basically learned was a couple of things. One is, is that sugarcane started in Papua New Guinea 10,000 years ago, that the Polynesians and the Micronesians before them were, were spreading it around the Pacific Ocean for at least 3,000 years and taking it with them wherever they went as they would settle new islands. And that most interestingly for us, a thousand years ago, the first Polynesian wayfinders discovered and settled Hawaii and brought with them probably two or three varieties of sugarcane with them, most likely from Tahiti, along with other plants and some animals. And they basically settled what is now Hawaii. Um, and from those two or three varieties, over about 800 years in complete isolation, they developed 40, about 40 different varieties wow. between, you know, between 34 and 40. And so that's, when we learned that, we had already committed to making rum agricole from fresh juice. And that, yeah, there's a good picture there's, of it. Thank yeah, you. some that's of the about, varieties, yeah. That's about 10 or 11 varieties. And you could see, you know, the, what would happen is they would mutate. And obviously these are beautiful. And so yeah. when they mutated, they said, oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. And then they would cut it, isolate it, let it grow into its own plant. And then, and then, and then you know, come up with stories and uses for it. We call it mo'olelo in Hawaii. Um, and it became culturally, you know, significant plants. Um, and there was this huge, super successful field system happening, you know, if you will, you know, while the Europeans are in the dark ages, Polynesia is thriving. Mm. Um, and this was all sort of deduced via, um, um, DNA. And so he ended up getting his PhD at Stanford from what he learned, but we were we were just, uh, we couldn't believe what a good gift this was because now instead of making, you know, rum from just some sugar cane, we realized that this is actually indigenous plants to Hawaii that are unique only in Hawaii. Mm. Um, and to our great, you know, and, and, and this is a really good group because I think all of us sort of are coming from the same place where we just want rum to be incredible. And we all had our own separate experiences with it and we're just like we've got to you know really elevate rum so that's what i'm super proud of this group for doing and 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 there's another company i saw i think it's tyler from kohana yep. coincidentally they were basically doing the same thing that we were um and they came up with the virtually the same idea so they're also growing um these same varieties of sugarcane on oahu and they're making um, um rum agricole as well um, and so it's really exciting to see rum actually being premiumized. Um, and, and as everybody on this call obviously knows, it's, you know, arguably one of the most versatile cocktails there are. And it's funny because we did the farm, we did the distillery and we did the restaurant out of pure ignorance. We just assumed you had to have all those things if you wanted <laughs> to have a really good rum. And then after we get started, we realized that's, taking on a whole lot you know you don't really need to bit. do all those things <laughs> off the get-go but it didn't matter because we were so excited about about really just trying to make this you know world-class spirit that we just we did everything that we thought we should do and and it, you know it turns out it's obviously quite a bit of work but it's also a lot of fun um, and it's really fun for people in Hawaii because this is another way that we get to really share something that's truly uniquely Hawaiian. I mean, these are yeah. literally the plants that, that, that helped form the culture of Hawaii and we get to share it with the rest of the world. And so, you know, that's, that's what's super fun for us about this. Yeah. And I, I want to circle back to a lot of what you guys are saying, and we're already getting some, some good questions in. Um, but first Pepe, I want, I want to give people kind of a, a snapshot of what things look like um, for you guys down in San Juan. So um, give us, give us the overview of, of kind of, you know, what, what production looks like your sugarcane production, where it is relative to the distillery and, and what kind of, you know, what does it look like throughout the calendar year for you in terms of harvesting and stuff like that? 
Sure, thank you. Um, well, we started the, our project in around 2010. Uh, started to collect Puerto Rican heirloom varietals that were developed in Puerto Rico during the Puerto Rican heyday uh, sugarcane production. Puerto Rico had over 350,000 acres of sugarcane planted. There were over wow. 25 sugarcane mills uh, throughout the island. There was a, a train that transported sugarcane from not only the plantation and mill owners, but the, there were other plantation owners that produced the sugarcane. And the train would stop at their farm and they would load it and then it was carried over to the mill. Uh, after uh, Puerto Rico was a, mentioned was a fifth largest producer of sugarcane in the world. And it was, a, it was every, every family in Puerto Rico was touched by, by this tradition, by, by the history of, her, of sugarcane. Many fam uh, every family in Puerto Rico was touched by it. It was the most important thing that was going on in the island at the moment. Puerto Rico was a, was agricultural based. Uh, we produced tobacco, coffee. Um, uh, sure, uh, sure cane was a main crop and it was really, really big. Uh, Puerto Rico got to a point where it couldn't compete any longer with uh, producers from much larger countries and that had, didn't have the standards of a U.S. territory. Puerto Rico became a U.S. territory in 1898. And so we had, by receiving, having to uh, comply with all the regulations and rules and, and all that, uh, it, it simply was impossible to compete. So little by little, the industry went, started to die, and it was impossible to compete till it disappeared in the early 90s. Um, and, and just just to jump in real quick, if if anyone goes to to visit your distillery, you have this really cool little area with with all these these photos of kind of like the history of sugarcane in Puerto Rico. I remember you showed me when when I visited a little over a year ago. Um, it's really extraordinary just to see um, all of all of that history, just the, the the pictures of what what used to be there, right there at the place that's that's now you know trying to bring sugarcane back a little bit. Yeah, our, our one of our you know main uh, uh, motivators of this project is to be able to show what the sugarcane industry was represented in Puerto Rico and is, and that is intertwined with our uh, more contemporary rum production. So we're marrying tradition with rum production in a, con a, new, a recent contemporary story. And basically we were able to rescue uh, 20 stocks of sugarcane of Puerto Rican varietals. Uh, they, were, they were all numbered. And one of them was the, the one that we're uh, promoting and developing the most right now. By, by chance, Eric, it's also a, a and Steve, it's a, it's a red sugarcane. And it was the last variety developed in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico had, has, has an, an amazing uh, agriculture university in Mayagüez. And in the University of Rio Piedras, the University of Puerto Rico had a, a rum uh, experimental plant. So there was a university program where you could go study how to make rum. That was shut down also after the sugarcane industry uh, declined and disappeared and but there was so 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 much uh incredible uh scientific development of varieties because it, it, it was a big industry so they were creating the more resistant varieties that had less fiber had more juice and and basically they all evolved from the original puerto rican varieties that were imported uh originally in this part of the world they came from portugal uh, Portuguese would stop in Barbados and do a stop there before heading to Portugal. And the sailors would exchange stories with the local uh, uh, guys in the in the ports in Barbados, and they would give them some pieces of sugarcane, and they would try this and try that. And that's how rum was basically created and invented in Barbados back in the 1700s, late 1700s. Um, that's spread uh, through vendors or little sales salespersons that sail the islands and they took some sugarcane to the Dominican Republic, to Puerto Rico, to the other islands, and that's the way that that started propagating. So anyway, we basically rescued uh, from almost extinction because it was it, there was this program program that 40 acres were saved 
for future generations uh, to be able to keep the, this history of uh, these 50, 60, 80 varieties of sugarcane that had been developed uh, and throughout Puerto Rico's uh, sugarcane era. And that project, project was abandoned and everything was dying out. So we, were, we got there on just on time and were able to rescue five stalks of cane of five different varieties. And we planted basically 80 feet with five stalks of sugarcane or uh, 50 feet. And it, each, each line had their little sign with a, with a number of the variety, the Puerto Rican varietal number. And from that, we propagated that and created uh, a third of an acre of, of the five together. Then we converted that into three acres, and then that, that converted itself into seven or 10 acres. Then we were able to plant up to 80 acres, which was the, the most we've ever had. Um, basically, and how, was, but Pepe, how many, how many acres are right there behind the distillery? Because if I remember correctly, I think you have multiple places where you're growing it, or, or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Is it all right there at the distillery? Yeah, we, we own a 14 acre farm, which is our property. It was our was one of our farms we bought in the early 90s. And I decided to create the, our home base for the distillery here. So we have a fenced four acre area, which is a distillery, our aging warehouses, our offices, and our uh, La Casa de Pepon, which is, is our little gift shop and our little uh, visitor center that we've created. And it's basically a, a, the original Puerto Rican house uh, made of cement and simple, but quite nice. And basically, this is like a destination, and we have eight acres of sugarcane planted here, so whoever visits is able to walk the eight acres of sugarcane, they can cut sugarcane, they can see how, it, how it's milled here in our facilities. And then we have another 100 acres that are planted about 10 minutes from here in the town of Vega Baja, where we've propagated and planted those 80 acres of sugarcane. We used to have sod there planted. As I mentioned before, we had the land, we had the landscaping business, and we've been uh, eliminating the sod and, and planting the sugarcane. Um, the we were to inaugurate the project. The project started around 2011. Uh, we acquired all the distillery equipment in 2010, I think it was. And the building started building. We got construction permits for a distillery in 2012. And it took us four years to get all the permits together, to be able to get permits from everyone. Permits from the federal government, were, we, had, we got those like in 60 days. Then the local permits were, took much longer. Uh, there's, yeah, uh, you know, I, I had this idea that I would, would be able to develop my distillery inside my, my sugarcane farm and that everything would be compatible. Mm -hmm. said, no, 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 no. It, it doesn't work like that. You need to have an industrial law where you're gonna have your industrial distillery and you're gonna um, uh, do, do this operation. So we needed to rezone within our farm, a part of the farm, the four acres are we had to be rezoned as industrial so we wow. could do this operation. So that took a while. We, it, was, it was a lot of, a lot of, uh, expense and, and, and time. Um, so basically we, we, what we do is we uh, cultivate our sugarcane. Uh, our growing period is about eight, eight to 10 months. The, our normal cycle for sugarcane for sugar would be uh, maybe 12 months, 14 months. So we shorten the length because we don't want sugar, uh, the uh, bricks of the sugarcane juice to be in excess of what it should be. Usually it's between 15 and 18 percent bricks because um, we've noticed that yeast in uh, high intensity sugars, like the normal uh, bricks for sugarcane cultivation or sugar for, to, for making sugar would be anywhere around 20, 22, 23, 24 bricks of sugar. But yeast won't work well because there's lots of hidden sugars in there. There's other types of sugars that are hidden in there. And the yeast will simply, will have a uh, uh, stump uh, fermentation. So uh, we, our cycle is around eight to 10 months and we aim at 18% sugar or 18 bricks. And the, our yeast work wonderfully fine. So we 
get out proper fermentation. And then basically we distill in, it's all distilled in our pot stills. And we have a dirty pot still, which is the pot still which, where we do our first distillation. And then we have our clean pot still where we do our second distillation. And that basically it's, it's an incredible aromatic uh, product, has a completely different taste than, than from molasses distillation. Oh. And basically, that's it. Um, and I, I have this one last picture of some of your sugar cane. Uh, which, is this the primary varietal that you're using? This is the one we're replanting everything with. This was the last okay. variety that was developed in Puerto Rico. And okay. it was rescued from uh, the town of Gurao in Puerto Rico. And it, it has a soft core. It's got uh, less percentage of fiber, which means more juice within its structure. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an ideal sugarcane. It's extremely sweet and it's a, it's a beautiful sugarcane. So we're, we're basically uh, almost planting everything with this variety. Excellent. And um, you, you guys have all spoken a little bit to, you know, the the challenges that are unique to having this kind of operation where you're not only a distillery you're also running a farm obviously there are factors of running a farm that are beyond your control um weather nature etc um well what have kind of been the biggest challenges for each of you or, or learning curves maybe that have come with with not only running the distillery, but growing sugarcane and, and having to know, you know, when you need juice or when you need syrup. And, and it seems like this whole logistical, um, I, I don't want to say nightmare because that sounds bad, but it seems like a really a, a monumental logistical challenge to me. And I, I'm curious from, from your perspective, what have been kind of the biggest challenges um, or learning curves? Yeah, it, it, if you allow me, it, 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 it's, a, it's an extremely difficult business. And uh, we were to inaugurate our project in December of 17, uh, 2017, and we were slammed by Hurricane Maria, the worst hurricane that has hit Puerto Rico in the last 70 years. Right. And my crop, I, we had 80 to 100 acres ready for cultivation, and it was total loss. It, it, we completely lost everything. Uh, the, we're surrounded by a river that runs around the, this specific farm, which we selected because it was, it was this specific farm had produced the highest yields because it's surrounded, it's like a peninsula, surrounded by two rivers. And it's, it's impacted by fresh water from, 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 the, from, from the soil, from the sides. So this specific farm was like the most extraordinary place to, to grow sugarcane that we could find in the island. And by, check, by coincidence, we had, we, we already had 45 acres of that farm rented, which is where we used to grow our plants and our sod. So we basically planted everything and the river uh, overflowed and we hadn't seen a flood. This was a flood of 100 years. Everything was basically completely destroyed. So this is, and you know, we were uh, uh, really shaken uh, economically, emotionally. Yeah, yeah. We went out there, it was like they had dropped the bomb. And not only us, but everywhere you looked in, in Puerto Rico, because the hurricane ran over Puerto Rico through the, through the middle of it, and it basically ran over us. And it was really devastating. So we had, you know, we, we were, we confronted the situation of either we, you know, go forward with it, is this, you know, is this worth continuing? And after a couple of weeks, we forgot everything about the hurricane and started cleaning up and replanting and collecting whatever we could salvage. So we were able to salvage some of the cane and, and mail. And that's the product that we bottled now that we just launched our first edition of a 24-month 24 age Rompepon, uh, which mm -hmm. is the first Ron Agricola uh, in Puerto Rico that has ever been made. And we made 800 bottles out of it, and they're all numbered and signed. So we're very proud of this. And anyway, we're planting and, and continuing and going forward. Having been a farmer all my life, I can tell you that a farmer's life is extremely unpredictable. There's, you know, you don't right. know where you're going to get an extreme drought. 
extreme rain or a storm or a plague of insects or it, it's 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 it is a challenge and but I uh, we feel confident that we're, we're going to have a good run for for the next dozen of years or so and that will be yeah will be a uh, full sail ahead Absolutely. Um, Steve, I, I know you looked like you were going to uh, jump in there earlier, um, just speaking to kind of the, the biggest challenges or learning curves that you guys have experienced. Yeah, I mean, uh, I want to give Eric some time, too, because I think we've been talking quite a bit. But Yeah, we can't uh, forget about Eric. Quickly, <laughs> just real quickly, um, it, it, it's a good point that, that, that Pepe makes is is these farms, at least it sounds like in everybody's case, didn't exist. There wasn't just, you don't just jump into a sugarcane industry. And then the scale of which we're doing it was so different than the industries that were before us in Hawaii. These massive scales of, you know, hundreds and thousands of workers all over the island were growing sugarcane. And then we're coming back with this super boutique. It's, it's almost oxymoronical for people. They're just, they didn't even understand, like, why would you buy land on the ocean to go plant the crop that has virtually no cultural or, or uh, economic value anymore. Mm. Um, and so it, it, it's for us, it started with 651 gallon pots in our yard in order to get enough starts to grow, you know, and it's very iterative, you know, 18 stocks gets 650 pots, gets eventually two acres, gets eventually you know, 20 acres and you have to keep scaling up in order to actually to get this going. And so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. And, and, and you, you learn a lot about the plants when you do it, you, you really, you know, begin to enjoy the plants as an ingredient. Um, and for us, you know, we can, we harvest all year round. We're constantly harvesting. We'll do three harvests a week and we just continually just go through the field and, and do it. But I'm kind of interested for Eric. Um, I guess, and, and the, we, we talked to some people in Louisiana and I'm kind of interested in how both of you guys juice, for example, too. But one of the struggles that we've had is, OK, now that we finally figured out how to harvest this stuff, um, juicing becomes sort of an issue. And, and how efficiently can you juice? And there's no small scale juicers, you know, because everything was the size of, you know, your living room before. And there would be, you know, mills that are two acres big. Um, and so. I know in Louisiana, there's a little bit more family style farm. So I, I assume you can take advantage of that in, in Georgia. Um, but that to me is, is a big challenge is, is just getting equipment that's sort of the right size and processes in place that are the right size for, for companies their size. So like, how do you, are you guys just once a year, correct, Eric? And then, and then, so you don't have to deal with all the juice, then it's a, you turn it into a syrup to preserve it. Correct. We, um, uh, we ferment as much as possible, uh, as, as much as we can, uh, uh, to the extent that the, the wine is, 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 the fermented wine is storable. And uh, the rest is, the, the vast majority is uh, uh, condensed into, uh, into syrup. The challenge that we've had, of course, is that uh, no one had been growing sugarcane in, in this area since uh, the late 1800s. Right. And so there's, uh, large or small, there's no infrastructure, there's no knowledge, there's no know-how, there's no history, there are no, there's, there's nothing to relate to. Uh, the whole farming industry focuses on, uh, on peanuts and cotton, and corn, Pecans. You know, what's funny is our very first juicer was a little three roller um, that we actually got from Georgia. And we called people up in Georgia and they sent us this mail from the 1800s and they thought we were crazy. Like, what do you <laughs> want this? What do you want this thing for? You know, but we actually had to go to you guys to try and figure out how to how to get the sugarcane juice. Yeah, the uh, uh, Columbus Iron Works used to make uh, uh, small crushers. Uh, but of a size that were were designed to be driven by mules, had two arms with, yeah. with yeah. two mules walking around, and so that's all very small scale. Um, and uh, we have a couple of them uh, just for you know just to to demonstrate to people every fall when we harvest, uh, we use a couple of those now driven by an, uh, an electromotor. 
uh, and people can come in and you know stick in their own stalks and say, oh, uh, I'm drinking a little bit of, uh, of sugarcane juice. Um, but uh, I, uh, because the infrastructure wasn't here, the history wasn't here, um, looked around. I even went to uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Pepe, to, uh, to see if I could, could find anything there. Uh, closest, of course, Louisiana. Uh, and uh, ended up uh, buying a crusher in India, a mid-size uh, crusher which is uh, driven by a diesel engine. And um, that thing runs from mid-November uh, through mid to the end of December, 24 by 7. And uh, we, wow. we, we, we crush everything we, uh, we have. Sto ferment goes from the crusher into totes, ferment and store as much as we can to have a true, what would, he, what would be the local equivalent of an agricole. And uh, the rest of the juice is condensed to uh, syrup. Yeah, and the subtext there for, and it's not obvious to anybody, is this juice is extremely volatile. Um, so it's usually a matter of hours. Um, if you let it sit around for a matter of hours, it's, it's already on its way to being fermented. Yep. And if it's not your yeast, it's bacteria or wild yeast or a combination of the, and, and, and it's ruined in no time. So it's unlike other distilleries where heating is part of the process, which cleans, you know, cleans it by killing all the bacteria and giving a fresh start. It's really difficult to deal with, with that. And I think that was our biggest challenge was trying to figure out how do we turn this super delicious juice into, into a really good fermentation and, and to be able to control it. Yeah, and, and do it. Uh, that's what we do instantly. It, 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 it flows from the, the, the crusher to fermentation tanks directly. And Eric, there's a, a question that came in um, that it, I feel like now is a good time to throw it in. Um, so this is from, um, they just have the initial Z. So Z is asking, uh, with close field proximity, would Richland consider an annual harvest release of an unaged cane juice agricultural rum, uh, just a batch or two at harvest time? So it, it sounds like you're you're allowing some of the juice to ferment. Is that what goes into your unaged product, or is that also made of made from cane syrup as well? Um, no, uh, whatever we have uh, made or are making every year from directly from juice. Uh, is um, uh, is bottled as a as a virgin rum to to really bring out or really let the the vegetal experience be as uh, as powerful as possible, and um, um, we actually do what uh, Z is uh, suggesting, only it's been been on a on a very small scale trickled in uh, to sales in the two distillery the two we have we have two distilleries uh, so z's not on that mailing list huh <laughs> z should uh, <laughs> uh, jump on the website and uh, uh, and and follow that because it it, it is sold in the uh, two distillery stores as long as it is available uh, usually in the in the course of the year it's gone and you sell you sell cane syrup as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We do, and and more and more so. We see more and more restaurants that um, you know are fanatical about it. In some cases, yeah. they uh, they ban sugar from their kitchen <laughs> and only uh, only use uh, uh, sugar uh, this syrup, which has no additives. It, the only thing it has seen is heat. That's that's all. Right. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. And that's, 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 that's part of the fun of making the agricole is if once you get the process figured out and you really learn how to control it, is that there's nothing. You add nothing to it. There's no colors, no flavors, no sugars. It's just the expression of the juice itself. And so that's, it's kind of like golf. You know, when you get that one swing, you're hooked for life. It's just, it's very similar to that. Yeah. And, and, and that is what actually had probably we share that, that is what makes it very gratifying to be able to show a bottle of rum and say, hey, the only two ingredients in here are 
sugar cane juice and water, literally. There's, there's nothing else in there. No other, any, anything has been added. Um, and I, I want to make sure, I know we're almost at an hour here, and we've got some really good questions, um, some of which are kind of dovetailing with a few of the questions I had left uh, for you guys. And this is an interesting one because I know, um, I think I've spoken to you about each of this, and I know you each have, you know, arrived at different conclusions for how you do this. But um, we had a question asking, should distilleries from non-French speaking areas use the word agricole for cane juice rums? or use a local term for agricultural rum. So um, I know you've all obviously thought a lot about this and I'm interested just to kind of, for each of you to share your experience and deciding, you know, how how you figured out what to call your rum. Um, I, I, Eric, you wanna jump I, I can in? Be, I can be very brief about it. Uh, we never do that. Uh, the term agricole is protected within a French jurisdiction. And um, we, call our rum pure sugar cane juice rum and that's it but from our side yeah, we we, i'm oh, sorry no no please <laughs> okay uh we battled with the idea of calling it agricole uh, wrong agricole it would be a mix of two languages uh, i personally feel that agricole is not a protected word it means agricultural in french that what is registered and there's rights to it is Rum, agricole, rum with an H, agricole of Martinique and other islands maybe do are do have the word registered. But uh, for someone in the States, for example, to try to privatize or claim the, the right to use the word agriculture, it would be preposterous. Uh, anyway, I, I didn't want to get into, into that pickle and I, I, I made a few calls. I even spoke to Will to see his opinion about it. And I decided to call it Rome Agricola, so no one can, you know. And I even got some feedback saying, but you're using the word Agricola. And they said, but I'm, this is Puerto Rico, this is in Spanish. But still, you're using the term agriculture. So it, one has to be very careful here, but, you know, we call it, it we've named it Rome Agricola because we're in Puerto Rico, it's Rome Pepon, Rome is Rome. And we feel proud, and I, I feel that the best thing I could have, have done was to go with Ron Agricola and feel very proud of it. And, and we went all the way. So we actually call one of our rums, we call it Hawaiian Rum Agricole. Um, and for us, the decision was there's a lot of confusion with rum, and there's a lot of things that happen with rum that, that, that you know, that make it difficult for consumers to actually unwind what's actually going on with it. And so our intention was, is let's sort of normalize on something that, that most of the world understands and, and has direct meaning for them. And then of course we use the word Hawaiian right in front of it to show them that this is how we're doing it in Hawaii. Uh, are you a single estate? And uh, for the, uh, it means it comes field to glass from one house, right? And leave it at that. Yeah, um, well, like I was saying, you know, um, all, all three different perspectives. And um, I, I think that's probably something that we'll continue to talk about uh, just because I, I think the, the category of rums from fresh sugar cane juice, we're seeing more and more of it. Um, obviously, there are a lot of people all over the world in, in trying to kind of spread it, get more people to get excited about what's a wonderful category of rum. Um, so something that I think will be an ongoing conversation for sure. Um, but thank you for the, the question. That one was from Z as well. Um, we've got a few other ones here. Um, uh, here's one for you, Pepe. Uh, uh, Ernest is wondering, uh, does Picardi still harvest cane in Puerto Rico? Nope. Uh, to my knowledge, Picardi has never harvested sugar cane in Puerto Rico. Uh, according uh, Bacardi distills and has a, uh, an incredible distillery facility, one of the oldest in the world and of the largest in, in the world. Uh, they basically distill from, from molasses. Everything is distilled from molasses. Uh, they, don't, they don't produce anything from sugarcane honey or uh, sugarcane juice that, that I know of. And we're good friends and they, they're, they're, they're good people and they, they, they have a, a very friendly uh, 
uh, attitude toward, towards us, and we have a very good relationship. Um, so that I know of, they don't. They they've never mailed a shirt in the island to answer that. Got it. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ernest, for the question. Um, here's a, a, another question for you, Eric. Um, this one is from Jer Anderson up in Minnesota. Uh, Jer asks, uh, Eric, do you notice flavor differences with rum produced from different depletion times? Meaning as you deplete your syrup, does rum created from the early portions taste different than rum from the later portions? Yeah, uh, we get that question uh, often, uh, and apparently that's based on experiences that may corroborate that. Uh, the answer uh, we haven't we haven't noticed that um, uh, there is a difference between varieties. Uh, uh, rum does have terroir. Uh, there is a difference in seasons. Uh, we've had different experiences with the same variety in, in, over two different years. Um, but uh, the differences in, uh, caused by the time of storage, we've never, never noticed that. And also have never noticed a uh, discernible difference in the constitution of the, of the syrup. Mm. We've, uh, I have saved syrup. Uh, probably since samples since 2001 or 2002 wow. or so, just to see how it stays, how 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 it preserves, and uh, you know, given the high sugar content, uh, it's it's condensed to about 80 bricks. Um, it uh, have natural sugars are the best known natural preservatives to mankind, and the 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 rum or the the syrup doesn't doesn't change unless you allow lots of air to it, mm. and it will crystallize. It will do all sorts of things, but uh, this is stored without any access to air, and I have never noticed any change. Uh, but can 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 you guys, Pepe or Steve, have have any views on that? Well, for us, it's fresh juice um, three times a week. Um, so we do notice the difference between the varietals. Um, we'll notice difference between climates. So for example, uh, you know, you people on the mainland will laugh at us, but the difference between winter and summer, it could be, uh, you know, maybe 10 to 10 degrees difference at the farm. And so the juice will come in, for example, right around, you know, this time of the year in the last few months, it comes in a little cooler. So maybe in the seventies. So what we'll find is, is that we'll get, um, our um, fermentation period might last, you know, 50% longer because there's just not quite the same amount of energy in the pot. So it'll be very subtle differences like that, um, that we notice, but because we're always starting with, you know, fresh juice and the process is always the same. Um, it's, it's different for us, but every batch tastes different and every batch, you know, we have a, a, a weekly um, process where we call it sensory and about six to eight of us will get together and we'll taste every single um, run that we've ever done. And then we usually put three or four of them together um, in order to come out with a product that, that is very similar to the, to the standard that we have. And if it, to, to be honest, if it doesn't meet our standard, then we don't bottle it. So you're kind of blending a little bit to achieve more consistency then? For, for our, yes. For, the, okay. for our primary Hawaiian rum agricultural product. And then of course we're hinting at, of course. So we're also working on a program where we do single varietal rums okay. that, that really express the difference between the different canes. Cause we're lucky to have, you know, these, these, these 40 different varieties of sugar canes. And some of them are extremely unique in, in, in both flavor and, and how they look. And so we're working on a way of really showing the differences between those as well. And some of those will be quite rare. Nice. Excellent. Nice. Uh, and Pepe, I wanted to give you a chance to speak to that as well. How much difference do you notice kind of, you know, maybe throughout the year or seasonal changes in, in the distillate you get? We cultivate sugarcane uh, year long, because you know, the weather permits it, and it grows year long. But we do have a rainy season, which is from May to December. And then we have a dry season from 
uh, January to May, that traditionally sugarcane in the Caribbean was grown aggressively during the, those uh, wet months, so it would aggressively grow. Uh, we, we've broken that mold and we're planting sugarcane all year long and uh, cultivating sugarcane all year long. The difference is that when, when you get lots of water, your water content in the stock will increase and your sugar level will decrease. So when you cultivate sugarcane during the dry season, you'll get a much sweeter, uh, uh, yeah. uh, more concentrated of, of sugar because it's like everything. Uh, in the uh, other fruits that we buy, that we use in other products that we make, uh, if we process mangoes or pineapples or um, uh, other fruits during the rainy season, they taste completely different than if they're cultivated during the dry season. So it, it, water has a lot to do with it. And we get, right now we've had a dry spell and the concentration of the sugar in the juice is high. But as soon as it starts raining now in May, we'll, we'll see that that it will, it'll change. We have a, uh, our mill processes uh, three tons of sugarcane per hour. And so we go through sugarcane pretty fast. And we do have a pasteurizer where we deposit our sugarcane after three different filtration systems. Uh, we deposit in a tank that is supposed to then go through a pasteurizer to kill the wild yeast and, and bacteria. We don't, we've never used it because we feel that it'll take away so much flavors and terroir and all the good things you want in the juice. And the way we mitigated that is pitching in the yeast, we pass immediately the juice to the tanks and we feed the yeast immediately. So our good yeast will take over the fermentation and not allow the wild yeast to, you know, to take over. So basically that's the way we've been doing it so far. And I think we'll keep sticking to that. Hey, I got a nerdy question if I can for Pepe. So three tons per hour. What's the what's the juice that's coming out? What's that? How much juice are you producing? So our, same time mill, our mill produces extract. We have our sugarcane uh, is traditionally about fifty percent is bagasse and fifty percent is water. So uh, our mill system, we have a single mill. Uh, we were going to install a double mill system to do a double extraction. And that would give you maybe five or eight percent more juice. Uh, so we felt, you know, the mill was one of the last things we installed. So we, we, for budget reasons, we decided to do a single mill. We don't add anything to the juice. We don't dilute it with anything. We ferment our juice just as it comes out of the mill. And I'd say we 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 get about forty percent juice of out of the hundred percent of the weight of the cane. By way, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we found is, is we can get, we can get 70 to 80% juice, um, but it takes, you know, a lot of effort in the milling in order to do that. So you might have to, that might be two or three runs to actually you know, we get. Just, yeah. We milled it just once and there's still juice in the bagasse, but it would be so much work and it's a big volume. We process about 20 tons a day. So it, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to redo all that bagasse. So what we're planning on doing in the near future, one of the expansions we have, because we've fallen in love with the whole process, is to add a, a, another mill. And then what we do is we re rehydrate the, the bagasse. Once it's pressed, we rehydrate it with a little bit of sugarcane juice that we've pressed out. We don't want to add water. The traditional way is to rehydrate the bagasse with clean water and you press it again, and then your sugar level, levels drop. So we would rehydrate once more and then press it through a second mill. That would be, that's the project we have in, in our plans. And also right now we have a table where we, we feed this big, you know, eight feet by eight feet table, and we pull the sugarcane down to the conveyor that goes into the uh, shredding machine. And then that goes up a conveyor that feeds the, the mill. Um, we're, install, we're also installing a, a automated uh, a new table that will raise itself and will have like these uh, mechanical features or legs that pushes the cane towards the, the feeding uh, conveyor to the shredder, then to, the, to the, the shredded cane into the mill. So, yeah. 
It's all about milling, it turns out. It really, yeah, it really the law is. is. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're seeing also about 50% or so. Uh, it's about 50% is the accurate, the accurate number. Yeah, in, in our part. And to do it twice is, is, is a lot of effort. I mean, for us, it, it's impossible to manage. So we need to improve on the, on, on the milling side to make it, create a more efficient extraction method. It's all natural. It, it's basically, it's just, you know, it, they're, it, they're, it's, a, it's a nice milling system. It works fine. Um, so I, I wanted to point out to everyone, I just shared some links to um, all of your distilleries websites in the chat. And one thing I wanted to be sure to ask all of you guys, because I know it's been anything but a normal year in terms of, uh, you know, doing tours and visitors and stuff like that. But if anyone is interested in, in or they're going to you know be in the area or maybe they live nearby, um, are you able to do tours right now? What does that look like? How much of the, you know, sugar cane? Uh, process can people uh, experience if they they come and visit you? We're uh, fully open at both the distilleries uh, in Richland and Brunswick for tours. Uh, the tasting rooms are open. The uh, gift shops are open. Um, uh, we do organize tours of the farm in the fall, usually okay. starting in October, October and November. And Pepe, what about you? Yeah, we're, we're, we, I mean, we had started doing tours uh, uh, last year and we immediately they were shut down. Um, we, I feel that the, the part of the, of being able to attract visitors and be, having the whole uh, concept of the agricultural uh, distillery, aging room, the sugar cane, the milling, everything, uh, all together is a, is a great experience. And we've seen the models from all the wineries throughout the world and all the distilleries throughout the world that they all have their, you know, their, their little uh, visiting programs. Uh, it's proven to be a huge business and uh, it, it, it helps in many ways to pay other bills that need to be paid. And it's a, uh, it also, I feel that it generates a uh, feeling of uh, ambassadorship of everyone that goes through here, that once they leave our facilities, they become your ambassadors and that's what yeah. we want. We treat them really well. We, they're, they're, they're our ambassadors and, and we treat them like family and make them feel welcome. And uh, we're doing a little bit of food pairings with rums and a little bit of chocolate and this and that, inventing stuff all the time. And it, it, it's, it's interesting. It, it, we don't take our f focus away from our uh, main reason of, of being, of course, which is a distillery, but it, it, is a, a, it is something that you have all the elements, you have all the tools already there. So right now we just hosted a tour uh, about an hour and a half ago. Now we have another group of eight persons uh, walking through the whole distillery. It, we take about we take our time. We take about two hours to show them around. We welcome them with a drink. Uh, we try to ha make them have fun, to laugh, and enjoy themselves. And we we give them a little bit of our history, the history of sugarcane and rum in Puerto Rico, and what we're doing. And uh, basically, we walk through the cane, the sugarcane field, walk back, walk through the distillery. They they see everything all the wheels in motion. We come back to the visitor center. We do a full tasting of everything. And I mean, they, uh, then they, they, they can go into the little gift shop that we have, that we have, they can buy product, they can buy whatever they like. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's a fun, it's a, it's really fun. It's a fun experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Steve, what does that look yeah, like for, for you guys now? For us, we actually opened a full, we have a 3,000 square foot bar and restaurant. So we started off with just, you know, we want to have the full experience immediately. Um, and to Pepe's point, it's, it's really marketing. Um, and so you have to be careful because you can't be losing money on your, you know, restaurants are great ways to lose money if you, if you don't operate them properly. And it's really easy to lose a lot of money in a restaurant quickly. Um, fortunately, we've got a, a team that that's good at it. Um, um, we actually we, we the guy that's in charge of our hospitality program actually ran it for High West, 
Um, and so when Whiskey, High West was right? sold to Constellation, we we immediately not only brought the CEO over as as one of our um, uh, advisors and board members, but also the head of operations um, as well. And so uh, we concentrate on that. We do probably between 75,000 and 100,000 people a year will come through wow. the program. And to Pepe's point, it's just that is the best way for people to really experience it, to really try it, to really understand what we're doing it to feel the love from the people that are working hard on us and, and just really get a flavor for, you know, the Island and, 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 and what we're trying to do. And so it's, 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 it's a lot of work, but it's, it's very gratifying. Um, and then we also have a, a tour program um, where people can sign up. That's just starting to open up again because of COVID, but you know, where you, where we have a, a, a tour company will actually come and take you to the farm and then you go okay. to the, and tr see the cane see see it growing see, you know see the ocean maui and all that try the cane in the field drink some juice and then we'll take them to the distillery where they can actually try the fermentation by the way the fermentation is delicious and i'm sure it's the case with both of you guys as well um you could drink this as beer all day long um and then free product from idea. there yeah well that's i mean <laughs> I, i'm sure we've all had that idea already so um and then, and then we take them down to the rum shack um, where they can enjoy it as a cocktail and, and lunch as well and do tastings and, and as well. And we're about to open up another uh, about 800 square foot space to do a private tasting room. Excellent. Um, well, we, I have one quick question that just came in for Eric and then I'll do one final question uh, for everyone. Um, but Eric, uh, Bob is asking, does Richland grow cane near their Brunswick location? No. It's all, uh, it's, it's, it's one farm and uh, it's the Richland farm uh, and we uh, ship uh, syrup, primarily syrup to uh, the Brunswick location from our farm. here. Got it. Okay. Um, so final question. This one comes in from Alan Fowler. Um, great question. Maybe a tough one to answer, but I'm sure you've all thought about this a lot. Um, he wants to know what is your favorite uh tasting profile or characteristic in each of your own rums uh, maybe you could point to one thing about it that you love what would that be well i'm not on mute so i'll start <laughs> <laughs> um, for us um the what's what's really exciting about our sugar canes that that i like um is the fact that you know these have been cultivated by humans for human consumption as a sugarcane plant, so this, these weren't these weren't designed for industry. They weren't designed um, to extract sugar. Um, they were designed literally as fruit, if you will, um, so they could just be eaten. Um, and so there's a lot of wonderful flavors in a lot of these sugarcanes. And and so for us, the challenge is, is to get those to come forward. So what I like to taste in our rum a lot. Um, is we get sort of this sort of, um, I like to call it stone fruit, but like cherry type flavors, which mm. sounds sort of almost counterintuitive when you're thinking about a white rum that hasn't been aged or anything. Um, we get a lot of like uh, different sort of banana variations. So anywhere from banana leaf to very sweet banana to plantains, um, a lot of pineapple flavors um, and, and some slightly more exotic things like lemongrass and things like that. So there's, there's a lot of depth and a lot of sort of different fruit flavors that come forward that we really look forward to. Um, and then the other thing that we really like is we, we strive for a very long finish um, in our white agricole. We want it to last. We call it everlasting gobstopper if anybody's ever seen the Willy Wonka movies, but we want it to last for about 14 weeks. Um, and that's something that you can actually do with this. And even though there's no sugar in the liquid, it, it just, it, you know, it feels so rich and wonderful. Um, and so that's, that's really what we're going for. Awesome. Pepe, do you want to, you want to jump in? Yeah. The, our, something that we've developed, started developing, uh, an inclination and we've noticed there's an amazing, uh, interest throughout, the. Uh, Puerto Rico and uh, the U.S. and everybody that contacts us and tries our products is going more towards our white rum because 
the white rum, you'll get all these herbal notes, you'll get bitter art, you'll get all these flavors that disappear once you just throw your rum into a barrel. You're interacting with 357 different elements that would impart into the product. And after a while, although I recall age, I recall rums I, I, I love and I personally enjoy them immensely. I really like them a lot. Um, I've been starting to tinker with, you know, experimenting with the, with the white rums and doing the famous tea punch which is a legendary original agricole drink uh, of the people who invented this thing. And it is a, it's an incredible, uh, it's an incredible flavors that, that comes out of these tea punch. And so we're basically, uh, my son enjoys the uh, white rum as well, very, very much. We are in our, our age rums are extraordinary as well. And we are in the process of aging, we're aging about half of what we produce and uh, bottling white about half of what we produce. And it, it, it's amazing the how strong white rum because of all the original notes of the sugarcane juice, the, 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 yeah, all these flavors, all these grassy flavors uh, no, and smelling notes that come out of this fresh pressed uh, sugarcane juice rum. Yeah. yeah it's, Eric. That's, it, it's, it's really, really great to hear. And uh, one of the advantages of uh, what you did here is bringing us together. I, I, I would really appreciate staying in touch with you guys because there's a lot that we can uh, exchange and, and learn from each other. Absolutely. But um, yeah, the, uh, um, what we enjoy uh, is the fact that the, 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 the rum made from the sugarcane here um, has definitely the grassy agricole notes, uh, hints of even of, of field flowers, uh, vegetal tones, even some hints of vanilla without the funkiness. Uh, way back when uh, I first tried grandpa's uh, agricoles the and, collection and uh, and and also traveled to the French islands and I thought that that was absolutely beautiful and lived as as oh if I could ever achieve that um, now I'm arrogant enough to say that after 20 years of producing here 21 um, I like this better the terroir <laughs> is 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 better it, it doesn't have the funkiness uh, and um, we bottle it at, at, uh, at uh, full strength uh, to 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 bring it out, and it's it's very successful. I'm I'm very jealous of of you guys. Our intermediate step to uh, syrup uh, does make a difference, and you can you can really say it, it's. It's not original. Or it's it's worse or better. You don't have to uh, attach a value judgment to it. But uh, converting, condensing the the juice into syrup and then ferment and distill creates a different product. It's 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 just noticeably different. So the portion that we uh, make directly from fresh juice out of the crusher into a fermenter has these notes uh, that I just described without the funkiness. There's even, there's, there's some fruitiness, there's some grapefruit in, in there. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And to your earlier point, uh, Pepe, uh, to use that for an old fashioned uh, uh, tea punch serving, it's, it's just fantastic. It, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, I, I would say the the best thing to do um, if you're watching is to, to to try to get your hands on some. I know it can always be a little difficult with distribution and things like that. Um, but I put the links to the websites up, and um, I know you you each have information on you know the best ways to find your products and things like that. So strongly encourage everyone to check that out. Um, but uh, thank you guys so much for for giving 90 minutes of your time today. I always I feel like these could always you know go for three hours or so. Uh, anytime we get a group of distillers together, it's always fun. 
Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, any anything to add or, or that we didn't get to uh, before we go? Uh, and by the way, uh, Z wrote into the chat, unaged cane juice rums are the best. So uh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it's on the same way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's it's as, as, as um, following on that, it's just, it's really interesting that that unaged rum, especially in agricole, are becoming so popular. Um, and and what I'm finding is spirits people, aficionados, try it because it's so different and so to the essence of of what a spirit can actually be about. That that we're we're surprised by the reaction that we get at the rum shack. To be totally honest, we have one product that we it's a take of the tea punch. We call it a high punch. So H-I punch instead of T-I punch. Um, and um, it's just room temperature agricole in a glass with a half of a, a passion fruit. We call it Lilikoi here. And a little bit of fresh cane syrup from our own farm. And it's a deconstructed daiquiri, if you will. You can do whatever you want with it. But we're really surprised that you know more people than not just, just drink the agricole all by itself. Um, all age groups, genders, you name it. So it's, 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 it's really fun to watch that. Um, and then we just, you know, we entered a spirits competition. I know these guys have accolades, you know, out the wazoo, but the San Francisco world, you know, they gave us a gold medal. So the point is, is the people love agricoles now. Um, and I really think this is, you know, an exciting time to be there. Um, and, and this is a sort of a really fun and unique product because it's not about the barrel. Yeah. And another thing is that people uh, uh, being made in the U.S. And, and being made like by us in Puerto Rico, by you in Hawaii, and, and, and you in Georgia is is something that has has become like a grassroots movement to support local distilleries. So you know, so it, it's it, it people are fascinated with you know. Like, trying out a small batch, small production, high quality stuff that is made within, you know, within the country, which right. is, is super interesting, not just, you know, imported stuff. We, we get bombarded from imported stuff from all over the world. And uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's phenomenal that all this support is coming from every direction. Yeah, and and Dave Russell, by the way, in the chat noted uh, such diversity among the three distilleries, yet all on the same subject. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I love about this is um, you know three producers all all you know in, in the same uh, country, but all coming to it from totally different perspectives, different environments, everything about it, and uh, you, you get. You know, for for me as a consumer, it's a great thing because it's uh, more more interesting, amazing products to try. Um, and Brad Kraus in the chat as well, who's down in Panama, um, he says we make rum from raspadura, which is concentrated cane juice. Uh, definitely more cane character than molasses. Um, so it sounds like that might be kind of similar to like the cane syrup that you're working with, Eric. Uh, the um, fagura is a dehydrated. It's more like a dehydrated uh, panela. Oh, okay. So this would be like crystallized. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So different yeah. from syrup then. Yeah. Very so cool. Basically, you take a piece of that and you dilute it and you, it turns, it, it's basically, it's dehydrated to a point where it becomes like a, like a cake, a piece of, right. of solid sugar. Yeah. It, 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 it shows all the, all, all the possibilities because that in and of itself had, creates a, a, a very different character. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it, 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 it's probably wonderful. Yeah. Um, and like you said, Eric, you, you, you mentioned, you know, so often we try to attach value statements to, you know, different uh, cane substrates and things like that. But, you know, I, I think what's great is just they're all different at the end of the day. Um, the juice is wonderful. I, I the, the aged rums you guys make from the cane syrup, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I think they're, they're, they're great on their own in an entirely different way and experience. So, um, the more the better uh, from, from my perspective. So yeah, and to um, Eric's point, I don't mean to, we actually have a blending program where we make rums from all kinds of rums that we found around the world as well. So we love rum agricole, but we love all rums. So whether it's made from molasses or dehydrated syrup or, or, yeah, or syrups, exactly. we love it all. And so there's amazing, amazing. The there, only thing that we do is, 
yeah, we'll put on the label what the fermentation source was um, so people can see that. But, you know, that's our goal is to share all this fantastic stuff with everybody. So sorry, I just. <laughs> no, it's all good. No, we're, okay. we're running way over time here, but I know we can but do this that, all day. That's, that's what it's all about, right? Just be straightforward about what right. the product is. Absolutely. I think that's and, the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, there are very good, very beautiful molasses rums. They are yeah. amazing molasses. Extraordinary. Rum. Yeah, yeah, extraordinary. Extraordinary molasses rum. They're just a they're, they're just a different profile. And yeah. uh, they're, they're absolutely there's some incredible molasses rum. I agree but but so. many of them try to obfuscate that by by hinting through all sorts of ways that it is not molasses, that it is you know uh, a, a fresh juice rum. Which is not true, and and it's it's a pity that there are value judgments associated with it. It's it's just a different Agreed. product, and yeah. the craftsmanship behind it determines what the uh, what the outcome is. It is uh, what uh, what I like about <coughs> this combination of being a farmer and a distiller is making a field to glass product. Number one and number two. Have no additives, 0.0, .0 additives. So yeah. What you grow goes into a bottle and yeah. with the use of water, but that's it. And um, purity and authenticity, and then you don't have to develop a brand that talks about the spirit of the wild horses that roam <laughs> the area and, uh, and so forth. Um, is, we like uh, horses though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do. We, we are. We are um, we have a, an, uh, as a matter of fact, an, uh, a Mustang sanctuary. At the <laughs> oh, but, wow. um, yeah. So, um, but, uh, you know, just, just be authentic. And right. that authenticity is, as far as I'm concerned, reigns. And yeah, I think that's, that's the thinking that's going to let rum premiumize. I think that's the thinking that's going to, that's already happened. A lot of work's been put into place to, to be honest and straightforward about rum. And I think that's why rum is really starting to take off. Is that people are realizing that this is one of the most interesting spirits categories, not the most, you know, how it has been in the past. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate that it has been has has the de has developed such a bad reputation. And you know, if you if you use a bad grade mill molasses, you have to distill up to 150 proof or so to get rid of all the contaminants. And now you have almost pure ethanol. Ethanol is right. ethanol is ethanol and tastes like ethanol. It, it, it's right. no longer rum. And then you have to reflavor it to make it taste like rum. Something, then you, yeah. Then you write on it pure cane juice, sugar, sugar <laughs> uh, and so forth. And, and 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 you buy it for uh, six ninety nine for seven fifty. <laughs> it, um, that is that is what what what's given rum a bad reputation, and it's it's so bad, and that's why Grandpa in, in inspired me. That if you do it well in an artisanal way, you have a beautiful product. It, yeah. Not a mixer. It, yeah. A pure, like you you just uh, said uh, earlier, Steve. I mean, uh, just. Pour a little bit of fresh rum uh, straight from the still, undiluted, in a glass without ice, and enjoy it. It's beautiful. It's very yeah. complex and it's beautiful. Well, and by the way, Eric, on that note, I'm I'm going to be seeing my grandmother soon for the first time in a while. Her parents immigrated from the Netherlands originally. My dad's whole side of the family is from the Netherlands. Um, and I never was, you know, I never got to share in with some amazing collection of agricole rum. So, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I was, I missed out a little bit there. <laughs> well, make sure that when you are in Holland, uh, that you make a stop at uh, Sheer. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Sheer. I've, yeah. I've, um, I've interviewed Karsten and Niels from ENA Sheer before. So that's at the top of my list if I'm, when I, when I eventually get over there someday. They've Logist got quite a collection. Largest rum traders in the world since the 1700s, and 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 fantastic people, super delightful, informative, open people. Yeah, that's always been my experience in in talking with them as well. So, yeah. um, again, thank thank you all of you guys, um, Pepe. I think you mentioned you have a tour going on, so I don't want to keep you from your guests too much longer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, out there. 
There, yeah. there's a group of eight friends that came to visit at three. But it's yeah. fine. I've had an immense pleasure meeting you guys. Uh, Will, thank you so much for doing this. Eric, a real pleasure. pleasure. Uh, Steve, the same. Uh, we're here and yeah, open house policy. You're invited anytime you want. And I'll same be here, guys. Thank same you. Here. Uh, well, let's, let's stay in touch, Pepe and Steve. I really enjoyed meeting you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was lots of fun. Thanks for putting us together, Will. Absolutely. I'm going to send an yeah. email around to you guys so we can stay in touch. Yeah, Please do. That's, I love it. That's great. Okay. Let's do that. Let's, do that. Let's, do that. Let's, let's tie up through emails. Well, yeah. And, all right, good. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Absolutely. Have a great thanks, guys. Right. And thanks. and again, everyone who's tuning in in the chat, there's links um, to each of their websites. Um, if you want to support what we're doing here at Savvy.co, you can go to Patreon to do that, patreon.com slash Savvy.co. Um, but with all that said, uh, thanks to all of you guys, and uh, we'll see you again uh, very soon. So uh, stick around, and if you're on our email list, you'll get notified of uh, what we have coming up next. But uh, thanks to all of you guys again, uh, and take care. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Will. Bye, Steve.